In the message, there were two videos that we held sacred. The first was the 1953 video, 20th Century Prophet. And the second was the 1954 video, Deep Calleth to the Deep. These were the only two films available to the public with real-life footage of the Prophet. I found this very odd, considering they had video recording equipment. The Branham family even had personal video recording equipment, given to them by believers. But 20th Century Prophet was the earliest video footage of the Prophet we were allowed to see. The Reverends Leroy and Paul Kopp traveled to Jeffersonville to speak with the Prophet, and we could see inside the Prophet's home for a glimpse into his personal life. The Reverend's cop listened as the prophet told his supernatural story. I remember watching in awe as the prophet told about how the pillar of fire came down over his head. This was a story we heard often, both from the prophet's sermons and from our pastors. We were told that it happened during a debate that the prophet was reluctant to attend. He described how that of the many photographs taken by photographers, God only allowed one single photo to be developed. How George Lacey, head of the FBI, came to verify that it was supernatural and sent the photo to Washington, D.C. But how much of these stories were true? Now that I was beginning to see the business side of the Branham campaigns, and knowing the types of men associated with the prophet, I began to wonder, was all of this nothing more than a publicity stunt? And knowing that F.F. Bosworth, who was a member of Branham's campaign team, was a founding father of the assemblies, I began to wonder, how would this impact their crowd size? So I began searching for news of Bosworth immediately after latter rain began to spread into the United States. I found an article in the January 1950 issue of The Voice of Healing. The Branham campaign had scheduled a meeting in the Houston area January 10th through 27th. They advertise using scenes from the 1947 healing campaigns at the Keele Auditorium in St. Louis with Little David and at the Shrine Auditorium in Phoenix, Arizona. Then invited all to attend their Houston meetings in January. On January 24th, the debate was announced in the newspapers. Both sides claimed the other challenged them to the debate. I found it odd that William Branham said that he alone would represent his side. The prophet said that Bosworth could go, but only if he didn't argue. After holding a conference with the other Baptist pastors in the area, Reverend W. E. Best said that he would debate once the challenge was formally issued. I also found it interesting that Reverend Best was concerned for his own safety in a non-argumentative discussion with ministers of the gospel. He told reporters that he might need police protection in the Sam Houston Coliseum. All William Branham continued to claim that he alone would represent his side. The prophet said that God would not allow any pictures besides his halo to develop. Every one of them was perfect negative. The Houston Press covered the debate on January 24, 1950. Photographs did develop, and I could see Reverend Best and Reverend Bosworth arguing with each other. Reverend Best explained that he was not opposed to divine healing, but was opposed to divine healers as such, and quoted the Apostle Paul's description of deceivers in the last days. I was shocked as I looked at the number of photographs that did develop. But I was even more shocked at the violence that erupted at the meetings. 
ministers of the gospel, swinging fists like they were in a boxing ring. Immediately after the fight broke out, the Baptist ministers quickly fled the building. And it wasn't until after the debate that William Branham took the platform. After a brief speech, the reporters described his military-style exit from the building into the night. During this speech, a photographer took a photo of William Branham, the men behind him, and a light above his head. This light, we were taught, was the pillar of fire from the Bible, an evidence that God was with the prophet. The Sam Houston Coliseum hosted many famous acts, some of which gave us pictures and video to examine. For its time, the lighting was quite advanced. From an NBA basketball game to the legendary John Lennon, Paul McCartney, and the Beatles, the Coliseum's lighting gave the audience a bright view of the stars. Some lights could be turned on and off independently and arrays of lighting could be positioned in various ways. Watching color in motion and video, one doesn't often notice the lighting. But when the video is paused and cropped and made black and white, photographs taken from the right angle in the Colosseum can be made to look unusual. In today's modern world of technology, we'd think nothing of a photograph like this. But in the days of yesteryear, a photograph with a halo was special. Branham's team began to darken the photographs to remove the men in the background who saw nothing, and later colorized, cropped, and altered the photo to remove surrounding details. Growing up in the message, I saw these images hang in people's homes and even in churches. There were even those who worshipped the image. Was this light really supernatural? I knew that if shown any other photograph, my first thought would be lighting, not pillar of fire. But I was curious about the rest of the prophet's story. The prophet said that the head of the FBI, George J. Lacey, issued a statement that it was supernatural. In 1920, superintendent, during a time when black female prisoners were segregated from white. In 1923, Lacey found himself in trouble when he was accused of physical assault. R.V. Ho-1, George J. Lacey, was chief of the Identification Bureau of Texas. He became and claimed that he saw George Lacey beating an African-American. Hogan heard the black man beg for mercy as Lacey knocked him down and continued to kick him. Other witnesses described being beaten by Lacey for making whiskey. One witness claimed that Lacey struck his only eye and he was kicked down the stairs while blinded. Lacey was discharged February 15, 1923, after the allegations were confirmed. The board declared no man has a right to take advantage of his authority to show brutality towards helpless prisoners. Somehow, Lacey was magically able to bounce back. Newspapers publicized Lacey's work with the Texas fingerprint system and Lacey opened up a private practice, the Lacey Fingerprint Bureau of Houston. This is not what I pictured when I thought about the head of the FBI. Was Lacey also a member of the Ku Klux Klan? I knew that it was unlikely George Lacey was ever accepted into the FBI after dishonorable discharge. Still, I wanted to know more about the man the prophet used to confirm the supernatural photo. 
In May of 1934, W.W. Sterling, George J. Lacey, and H.J. Rafen established a non-profit organization for crime detection. W.W. Sterling was Governor Ross S. Sterling's appointed Secretary of State for Texas. The Ku Klux Klan's invasion of public office in Texas has been widely studied since the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. It is well known that police brutality against African Americans was a problem throughout the southern United States. But in Texas, where Roy E. Davis had based his operations, men like Lacey beating African Americans was very common. Fortunately, in Houston, where Lacey and Sterling were operating, Klan activity has been well documented. In Houston specifically, the Klan's primary agenda was moralism and resistance to change. The Klan in Houston was so violent that Klan members were identified and asked to end the violence. Among those named as members in 1923, was Ross S. Sterling. Sterling was among those who joined the Klan in its early days and was asked to end Klan violence. Soon after the organization was established, Lacey was asked to test ballistics in a criminal trial. He was also asked to administer truth serum Though he wasn't a federal agent, Lacey's ties to Texas government enabled him to operate at a state level. By 1938, Lacey had advanced to president of the Texas Division of the International Association for Identification. Still, his assisting in criminal trial was far from federal. Lacey always remained a private investigator helping to examine documents for attorneys in criminal trial. I found it interesting to read some of the things Lacey said in his interviews. Awful statements, highly inaccurate, and yet exactly what the prophet said in his sermons. When a man drops to criminal life, he can get low, but he can't get as low as a woman criminal. I was shocked the first time I read his full report concerning the halo. It did not mention the pillar of fire. It did not mention the supernatural. The photographer did not rush the photo to the FBI. Gordon Lindsay of Branham's campaign team made the request. Lacey described scientific method to confirm the photo was not retouched and the negative was not altered, and summarized his findings by simply stating that the light in the Colosseum had been captured by the film. The same exact way that any professional would describe the photographs of the lighting above the head of the Beatles. Learning about the ties to the Ku Klux Klan in Houston, Lacey's brutal beating of African Americans and the publicity gained from the debate and photograph, I suddenly thought back to the Reverend's cop, who also appeared to be helping publicity. Who were they? Why did these two men, who weren't in the message, decide to make this video? Did they really believe the halo story after having been in the bright lights themselves? Or were they too part of a much bigger plan.